Lafcad. I am the director of Social Science Matrix, and I'm very pleased to welcome you uh, to today's panel. Uh, it's a Matrix on Point event on new directions in studying policing. Uh, this is actually our first Matrix on Point with a majority of graduate students on the panel. So we are also celebrating the up and coming generation here. And so I'm very pleased about that. Uh, and I also want to thank uh, especially uh, Matrix content creator Julia Sijek for organizing this wonderful event. Now, before we start, um, I just want to say a few words. First, uh, importantly, Matrix recognizes that UC Berkeley sits on the territory of uh, Huchin, the ancestral and unceded land of the Ohlone people. Next, I just want to uh, say a few words about Matrix. For those of you who are new to, uh, to our institute, we are a cross-disciplinary social science research institute at UC Berkeley. And today's event is part of this series, uh, Matrix on Point that is devoted to panel discussions on important matters of the moment. Now we have a series of upcoming events this semester, and especially this week, this is a very busy week, so I'll just mention the events this week. Uh, on October 28th, this Thursday, we will be hosting an event with performing artist Angelique Kijo, which is co-sponsored uh, by the Townsend Center for the Humanities, Cal Performances, and the Black Studies Collaboratory. And on Friday, October 29, we will host a panel called The Rights and Lives of Non-Citizens, um, which is going to be part also of this uh, Matrix on Point series. And finally, on November 10, uh, we will host a panel called The Labor of Fire, Firefighting and Incarceration in California. So please check our website for further details and on these and other upcoming events. And you, know, you can also follow us on Twitter. And now I have the great pleasure of introducing the moderator of today's panel. Nikki Jones is Professor and H. Michael and Ginny Williams Department Chair of African American Studies at UC Berkeley. Her work focuses on the experiences of Black women, men, and youth with the criminal legal system, policing, and violence. Professor Jones is the author of two books, um, Between Good and Ghetto, America, African American Girls and Inner City Violence, uh, published in 2010, and The Chosen Ones, Black Men and the Politics of Redemption, published in 2018. Her current research efforts are focused on the systematic analysis of video records that document routine encounters between police and civilians, with a focus on encounters that involve the police and Black youth in high surveillance neighborhoods. So without further ado, I now turn over to Professor Jones for an opening statement and also the panelists' introductions. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you for the, the introduction. And good afternoon, everyone. I was saying earlier that the last thing I did uh, before the pandemic began was in this room. And so even though we know things aren't quite back to normal yet, it's good to be in company with all of you and to talk about such an important um, and, and pressing topic. Uh, so it's a pleasure to welcome all of you to today's conversation, New Directions in Studying Policing. Uh, welcome to our panelists, to our Matrix in-person audience, small and mighty, and to those of you who are joining us online. I'm excited about today's panel. I received lots of invitations, as many of us do, many of which I have to turn, turn down, but it was easy for me to say yes to today's conversation, not just because I've de dedicated a significant portion of my career to the topic of today's conversation, uh, and it's certainly something I spent a lot of time thinking and writing about over the last year and a half, but because the panel centers the work of scholars, including, as Marianne shared, advanced graduate students who are, in fact, best suited to lead the way when it comes to developing new approaches to studying policing and to chart a study of policing that challenges the often taken for granted assumptions of policing, to build a study of policing that critically interrogates its origin stories, its impact on historically marginalized communities, its role in maintaining a racial order rooted in whiteness and white supremacy, and its promises for the future. Although the urgency of the months, the months of uprisings that followed the killing of George Floyd 18 months ago has calmed, the project of reckoning with the harms of policing remains. We must also reckon with the role the university has historically played in reproducing that harm, which could be a panel on its own. 
Because of that history, the university also has a responsibility to address its role in that work, and to encourage new paradigms, and to support the asking of new questions, and certainly to support students, scholars, and organizers within and outside of the academy in this work. Each of today's panelists are laying the foundations as we speak for new and necessary conversations. I've had a chance to work closely with two of our graduate student panelists today and very much look forward to learning more about the work of the remaining half of our panelists. So let's begin now uh, with introductions. Eduardo Batista Duran is a PhD student in jurisprudence and social policy at Berkeley Law. Originally from Michoacan, Mexico, Eduardo was raised in East San Jose, California. His work focuses on the development of police forces in early statehood California, particularly in gold rush era San Francisco. Welcome, Eduardo. Dr. Matthew Guariglia is a historian and researcher studying the intersection of race, policing, and technology. He is a co-editor of the recently published Essential Kerner Commission Report, and his book, Police and the Empire City, Race, Immigration, and Policing New York, is forthcoming from Duke University Press. Matthew is a policy analyst at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, where he fights how police use technology and serves as an affiliated scholar at UC Hastings School of Law and was formerly a postdoctoral scholar at UC Berkeley. Kimberly Cecilia Burke is a doctoral student at UC Berkeley's Department of Sociology and a research fellow at the Center for Policing Equity, a nonprofit that uses evidence-based approaches to create social, cultural, and policy change in the context of policing. Her research includes policing, inequality, and state violence, and is grounded in feminist ethics of love, mutuality, and respect. As a scholar activist, Kimberly seeks to dismantle us for them attitudes, challenge anti-Black racism, and build equitable solutions for the problems inherent to carceral institutions. Welcome, Matt, and welcome, Kimberly. Bree McLemore is a PhD student in jurisprudence and social policy with a designated emphasis in science and technology studies. Her dissertation situates smart streetlights as a case study for interrogating the adoption of technology in so-called smart cities and the implications for surveillance. A theoretical framework is informed by black feminist surveillance, surveillance studies, science and technology studies, and feminist jurisprudence. Bree is a health policy research scholar with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, a Berkeley Empirical Legal Studies Fellow, and a Technology and Human Rights Fellow at Taraz and Citrus Policy Lab. Welcome, Bree. So let's begin, starting with Eduardo. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I hope all of you managed to stay dry and avoid any uh, flooding after this weekend's much needed, but uh, at times overwhelming rain. Um, so again, my name is Eduardo Bautista Duran, um, and it's a pleasure to be here um, in company with not only the awesome panelists, but also those of you who are in attendance here in person and all of you joining us um, online. Of course, thank you to everyone who helped organize the event and to Dr. Jones for helping moderate our discussion today. So I'm just gonna go ahead and jump straight in. Um, I, I recently read an opinion piece from a local newspaper that made what I thought was a pretty interesting argument. <clears throat> the debates on the quote unquote real beginning of the United States have largely focused on slavery's arrival in the early 1600s or 1776 when independence was declared from British rule. Both reflect on what this nation was like before California entered the picture. The author argued, the United States, antically ambitious, deliriously diverse, and kaleidoscopically cruel, didn't get rolling until California arrived in 1848. And while California didn't formally become a state until 1850, the discovery of gold in 1848, coupled with the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo the same year, essentially refounded the country with new peoples, borders, and aspirations. In some sense, this was the culmination of westward expansion. Manifest Destiny meets El Dorado. This was a period that hastened the arrival of a new industrial age, giant financial institutions that continue to hold prominence into today. And relevant for our discussion this afternoon, <clears throat> it was a new stage in the invention of rationales to justify expansions in policing, imprisonment, and mass killings. In San Francisco, this required key decisions on how to establish law and order on the lawless frontier. So with the few minutes or so that I have left, uh, I intend to highlight what I consider to be some major events in San Francisco's early history that showcase why it's so important to spec step back specifically into San Francisco history and where I see the value for 
dialogue on current debates on policing. So the gold rush transformed San Francisco from a bayside settlement into an instant urban center. Sellers from all over the country and the world recognized that there was a lot of money to be made and not necessarily by marching into the gold fields in search of gold, but by establishing commerce and financial institutions that grew out of the mass movement of people and resources. Of course, city leaders quickly identified the need to implement a police force to deal with the onrush of people and the accompanying lawlessness and disorder that appeared with them. The small group of officers in 1849 that first appeared had no training, no uniforms or equipment, or even had an office from which to conduct police operations. If the goal was to establish a police force to be able to maintain order on the streets, the city's initial efforts failed. An often forgotten moment in Bay Area history completely reshaped the trajectory of San Francisco policing coming out of this period. In 1856, after a tumultuous start in the city's efforts to establish order, the business elite realized that they needed to take matters into their own hands if they wanted to protect their business and political interests. And they did just that by organizing what is recognized as the largest vigilante movement in US history. The merchant class refashioned policing through pseudo criminal trials, lynching, banishment, deportations, and through the militarization of law enforcement practices. The vigilante takeover culminated in their taking over of political power which enabled the city's elite to refashion policing in their vision. Former vigilante leaders formally became the first chief of police. They held prominent uh, positions throughout the uh, newly refashioned San Francisco Police Department. The vigilantes literally handpicked who they wanted to lead the new police force. And so the start of urban policing on the West Coast was not a battle pitched outside of dusty Wild West saloons, but was birthed from battles that pitted pro-slavery chivalry Democrats against pro-industry Republicans. It was a power struggle between white settlers and a city that was overwhelmingly white and male, but whose migration and settlement patterns also included a large and growing Chinese population. By the late 1870s, so less than 30 years before the city became the city, the Chinese in San Francisco accounted for more than 10% of the city's population. Their labor and services proved valuable not just in San Francisco, but in the construction of the transcontinental railroad that helped connect California to the rest of the country. With the demise of the gold rush and the completion of the railroad, both Irish and Chinese workers became unemployed. With competition for jobs greater, Irish-led unions stirred up resentment and discrimination against the city's Chinese residents. With Dennis Kearney, a name that might sound familiar, leader of the Working Men's Party of California, right, raising the cry, the Chinese must go. Anti-Chinese rioting in 1877 put the city in a state of crisis once again. And again, the police department cannot maintain order and relied on the mobilization of thousands of volunteers to help quell the riots. City leaders decided that an expansion of policing was necessary if the city was to manage urban problems, such as rioting and nativist violence. Again, the city needed to appear open for business and open to all newcomers. So not to be mistaken for progressive racial politics in the defense of the city's Chinese community, the McCoppin Act of 1878, a year after the rioting, nearly tripled the size of the SFPD and resulted in the creation of a specialized task force named the Chinatown Squad that served as a precursor to the vice squads, gang units, and special weapons and tactics or SWAT teams deployed in communities of color in the 20th and 21st centuries. The notoriously violent Chinatown Squad sought to establish clear lines of communication with Chinese residents and an early example of community policing, community policing initiatives, even if these relationships were often coerced or unwelcome. The result was not necessarily a safer Chinatown, but a more segregated one. The city's first ghetto grew out of, a, out of city ordinances that sought to quarantine the quote unquote diseased bodies in San Francisco's Chinatown away from the city's white residents. The law dictated racial separation and the city deployed its Chinatown squad enforcers to make the separation of the Chinese and white residents an enduring one. So why do we start here? Why does this still matter? And more broadly, where does this fit in how we understand the development of policing as we know it now? First, I think it's important to recognize that we need to resist the story that paints the start of racially targeted policing somewhere in the 20th century as Northern urban centers became increasingly black, or if we're talking about the American Southwest, increasingly brown. 
As historian Sally Hayden has instructed, slave patrols in the 1600s were intensely interested in the surveillance and control of black movement, black bodies, and black unfreedom. The law made black subjugation a necessity to enslavement and the slave patrols helped enforce this system. Approximately 200 years later, in 1823, the Texas Rangers were unofficially founded for the purpose of a punitive expedition against, quote, a band of Indians. In the mid 1800s, the Rangers captured or helped to capture run, runaway enslaved black people seeking freedom into Mexico. Again, as, as my presentation highlights today, San Francisco in the last quarter of the 19th century developed urban policing techniques that have been expanded and perfected for racial containment efforts still seen today. And so reflecting on San Francisco helps us expand our understanding of race-based policing outside of a black or white, uh, black, white, or even brown, white racial context. Law enforcement has a lasting and intimate relationship with a commitment to social organization based on white supremacy. We have to contend with this history in any conversation that seeks to take seriously meaningful changes to policing today. All spaces that, that have required policing from the colonial to the modern US have turned to a racial apparatus that has seen so much buy-in from people who re also recognize themselves as white. In our contemporary moment, activists, scholars, and interested observers alike have started to contend with this history, San Francisco's origins and the policing of the, China, the city's Chinese residents through the Chinatown squad as another important dimension to this discussion. Thank you. So I wanna thank you all for inviting me to speak and I thank my fellow panelists. I'm very excited to engage uh, with your work. Um, and so we're here today to think about new ways of studying and thinking about policing. And as a person trained uh, as a historian, uh, should I close out this or just minimize it maybe? Uh, as a person trained as a historian, but currently working um, in technology policy, I found that studying policing in the United States has always been a bit of a balancing act between understanding change over time and continuity. It's like a glacier where the external shape of it might change at the whims of thaws and refreezes, but the core of it remains unchanged. And the core in this sense being that of, of racial subordination, of extraction of, of labor and value uh, from certain communities, and then enforcing gender and sexual norms. Uh, but what I'm interested in are the discourses that have helped legitimize and re-legitimize policing over time in its current and historical forms. Uh, policing is kind of in general, fairly inefficient mode of achieving public safety in a holistic sense. Uh, in terms of uh, the number of crimes that are actually solved, if we look at the numbers, uh, the lack of evidence that they can actually really address the ebbs and flows of crimes which seem to occur kind of naturally and randomly, um, and the cost benefit of considering how much, how big budgets are for what communities get out of them. And this is to say nothing of the threat that police departments themselves uh, represent to public safety at large. Uh, so I've been interested in police attempt to re-legitimize themselves to mostly white, but also a multiracial middle and upper class. Uh, and obviously the, their first attempt at, at reinvestment or re-legitimation uh, is an emphasis on racial criminalization uh, and the promise of protecting white people from a, a social and geographically mo uh, mobile population of people of color. And this has been written about, obviously, a lot over the last um, few decades by scholars in pretty much every field. But the second legitimizing discourse, the one that I, I've been writing a lot and thinking a lot about in terms of technology, uh, is the so-called modernization attempts. Uh, attempts by police, uh, especially in our neoliberal era, to appear technocratic and often colorblind. Uh, scholars for decades, I'm thinking of course of the great Naomi Murakawa, uh, have spoken about how um, political approaches uh, and, and kind of the discourses of policing had a, a very explicit transition from explicit to implicit considerations of race. Um, and this is how you get, for instance, in my work, the transition from the Italian and German squad, which were squads in the NYPD, which were explicitly called upon to handle race in uh, immigrant communities, and how this transitions in language to what you get in the 21st century, which is the demographic squad, which is uh, the group of people appointed or promoted um, with uh, 
language abilities and who understood uh, who were mostly Muslim themselves who spied on Muslim communities in New York in the wake of 9-11. So this transition from Chinatown squad or German or Italian squad to demographic squad is the, the kind of deracializing of uh, police rhetoric. But technology has had a major uh, role in this process. Um, and so uh, I think that uh, one way forward is to interpret this long history of how technology has been used um, and how understanding technology and its uses can reveal uh, both how, how shallow um, reforms have been and how ineffective they have been, a police at large, but also can point to this greater continuity that even as technology changes, uh, even as the tools become digital and they become automated, what those tools are asked to do is a clear indication of lack of change and lack of progress. Um, and this to me points at how technology has kind of laundered what is essentially century old and very explicit tactics of racial subordination into ones that have been deracialized and kind of uh, uh, techno washed um, into this process of people claiming it's, it's just math or it's just science. Um, and this is how we go from you know, the Bertillon method, which was a, a primary way of identifying people before 1900 and required police to measure uh, over a dozen of a person's features, like the length of the ear or the distance of their eyes, to modern face recognition, which does essentially the same thing, but is digital and automated, uh, or, or manually training officers on how to identify makes and models of cars to AI that does it before them. Uh, we have all this new technology and yet we're still asking it to perform the same functions in part because we know that police themselves can be untrustworthy and ineffective or brutal and allowing computers to take over these tasks that we used to rely on the faulty eyes of officers or bad measuring with a, with a tape measure uh, in the form of the Bertillon method. But ultimately we're still searching for the same technical solutions to a century old problem, which is kind of baked into the police department. And that is the problem of trust that uh, throughout the late 19th and early 20th century, as the goodwill between police and communities, especially black and immigrant communities, which were growing in uh, urban and industrial northern cities, uh, as that trust withered away, police had to look for technical solutions to people problems. Um, and a lot of these came from uh, the world of empire, uh, as with the, the German squads and Italian squads, which is one of these attempts to create a method of policing that can do well in communities uh, that spoke the different language, had, had cultural or racial barriers between the communities and the people who police them themselves. Um, but the other methods are technocratic, and these also come from empire. Um, and this goes to the rise of police department's relationship with information. And what Annie Jacobson, the, uh, the journalist, has identified as so-called identity dominance. And when she uses that term, she uses it in terms of US troops in Iraq and uh, Afghanistan. But I think it really applies as well toward uh, weaponizing people's uh, identity and making them readily trackable and therefore able, uh, vulnerable to subordination by the state. Um, and one of the primary and early ways that this was done was fingerprinting. Um, fingerprinting traveled to the United States through the 1904 World's Fair, where it was formally introduced at the St. Louis uh, World's Fair, which also has the International Chiefs of Police meeting. And it was brought by Detective Ferrer of Scotland Yard in London. Uh, in turn, where he had championed this technology, Fingerprinting had actually been experimented uh, with and became uh, the go-to model of identifying people in uh, specifically South Africa and India, where it became a, a, a model for how to uh, track and identify people, even if there was a cultural and linguistic gap between the police and the police. Uh, so I have a quote from one Kansas City newspaper who saw the Scotland Yard display at St. Louis, and he said, it's not necessary to know a man's age, color, or any circumstances of his life in order to discover his personality by means of the fingerprint method. Um, and so these types of technocratic solutions to understanding people, face recognition all the way back to fingerprinting, emerge in part uh, as, as a way to ease this, this gap between the police and the police uh, in the sense that, you know, you don't need to uh, 
be able to garner witnesses. You don't need to be able to gain cooperation of the community or cooperation from the suspects themselves uh, if you have this, this technology which can ease over um, some of those gaps. Uh, and so I'll, I'll leave it there. Uh, I'm very happy to have this conversation and thank you all for having me. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Kimberly, uh, fifth year in the sociology department, and I am in the process of developing my prospectus. So today I will present uh, two studies that are informing my ideas for my dissertation. Uh, these studies are both drawn from my research in a mid-sized California police agency. I am approaching the study of policing through the broad theoretical lens of symbolic interactionism. I'm drawn to symbolic interactionism because it focuses on the mutuality of self and society, individuals as simultaneously cause and consequence of the collective. I think there is both a healing and liberatory logic at the core of symbolic interactionism. So here I've quoted Mead in his discussion of caste systems. He states that if individuals are so distinguished from each other, they cannot identify themselves with each other. If there is not a common basis, then there cannot be a whole self present on either side. Versions of this principle have been echoed in studies across uh, social hierarchies. In Du Bois and James Baldwin's studies of racial domination, Fanon's study of colonialism, Bourdieu's study of masculine domination, just to name a few. So I'm interested in what this feedback loop looks like for police officers in the communities they police. Doesn't it suggest that officers' capacity to achieve wholeness depends on their interactions facilitating that capacity in the other? I think that focusing on the ways that officers' quality of life and self is tethered to that of the communities they police facilitates an interrogation of the assumption that punishment is a functional response to crime. In other words, I think considerations of officer well-being are critical to an abolitionist framework. So now I will turn to the empirical work that's driving these kind of larger thoughts. This first study, um, I'm still revising, so definitely looking for some feedback here. Uh, the working title is Officer Safety is Public Safety officers' justifications of force. This study is based on my participation in and observation of uh, police use of force trainings, as well as interviews with a small sample of police officers. This study asks, how do police define public safety and what are the consequences of that definition? So these trainings were consistent uh, with a broad range of research that shows that police understand their jobs first and foremost as dangerous. Sierra Arevalo uh, in a 2021 article calls this the danger imperative, a frame that emphasizes violence and the need for officer safety. In this department, the danger imperative was also central to uh, the department's definition of public safety. So this agency was in an area associated with lots of gun violence. So their public safety goals centered on getting guns off the street and reducing gun violence. So the danger imperative worked to narrow the definition of officer safety and public safety to basically um, don't get shot. Surprisingly, in addition to the standard ambush and worst case scenarios, these trainings placed equal emphasis on reducing officer involved shootings. So they had this awareness that the danger imperative, uh, the need to assume that everyone is potentially armed and dangerous, put officers at risk of over-perceiving threat and potentially uh, shooting and harming the people that they were supposed to be uh, protecting. So the safety, uh, the training centered on ways to deal with this double bind of don't get shot, but also don't shoot anyone. The solution put forward um, was for officers to regard any noncompliance as an early warning signal of potential threat and to reduce the risk of that threat through early and quick detention, through handcuffing and restraints. The solution put forward in the training resonated throughout officers' interviews. Namely, when I asked for stories of uh, de-escalation uh, tactics, they often cited these interactions where they had quote, de-escalated using low levels of force like control holds. 
Officers described these forceful de-escalation interactions as achieving officer safety and public safety in the sense that restraining the person both reduces the chance that that person could harm the officer, but it also reduces the need for the officer to further harm that person. So again, a way to manage that double bind. Moreover, officers describe their own safety as public safety and that they are tasked with maintaining public safety. So if they aren't safe, then they can't do their job of keeping the public safe. And two additional things to flag in these findings. The department policy um, actually states that these low levels of force, control holds, restraints, handcuffing, are not considered reportable uses of force. So none of these forceful de-escalation tactics would be in police use of force data. Secondly, uh, I analyzed about two years of their use of force data, and in 38% of their incidents, resisting arrest was listed as the only uh, charge. Now, um, this is not just a matter of semantics. It's not just that officers have a different uh, definition of de-escalation than the layperson. It's also not that they have maybe a lower threshold of what constitutes criminal resisting than the layperson. Research by Berkeley's own Osagi Obasagi finds that courts overwhelmingly defer to police departments' internal definitions and policies to determine compliance with the law. So I think that officers' justifications of force reflect their capacity to signal compliance with the law and to some extent actually construct the law. This study suggests that when definitions of officer safety and public safety are narrowed to don't die and don't kill anyone, it creates situations where even well-intentioned officers may deploy force in the name of safety and ill-intentioned officers can hide behind a narrative of danger. Additionally, the hypervigilance and aggressive interactions mandated by the danger imperative are associated with increased cynicism, burnout in officers um, in ways that harm them and the people they interact with. It's worth noting that uh, states are changing laws um, so that resisting arrest cannot be a standalone charge. Uh, California is not one of them. And um, it was outside the scope of the study, but it would be worth asking um, where and with whom is the narrative of danger given more credence. Where my first study focuses on the potential pitfalls of existing definitions of officer and public safety, the second asks how might broadening the notion of safety benefit officers in the communities they police. This study titled Democratic Policing and Officer Wellbeing was published in Frontier Psychology uh, in an issue on police trauma, loss and resilience. Democratic policing is defined in the literature as policing efforts aimed at building trust rather than those focused on crime deterrence. Democratic policing styles try to establish legitimacy through procedural justice rooted in fair and respectful treatment, as well as community oriented policing efforts that are participatory and non enforcement related. So I asked what is the relationship between officer support for democratic policing and their well being, and how does this impact the communities they police. I draw on survey data interviews with officers and public uh, community survey results. So first, the data suggest that uh, police officers' endorsement for procedural justice is associated with a statistically significant decrease in occupational stress, depression, anxiety, stress, and negative affect. I found similar patterns uh, for officers' support for community-oriented policing, um, but note there was not a significant association uh, to decrease in um, job stress. Just a second while I figure my pages. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I turned to my interview data to help explain the association between officers' endorsement of democratic policing strategies and their improved health outcomes. First, every officer foregrounded the salience of us versus them dynamics as a source of stress in their daily work, specifically being confronted with and needing to navigate negative stereotypes about police. Officers described um, relying on strategies rooted in the tenets of procedural justice to navigate and reduce the stress of intergroup interactions, the groups primarily being police, not police, but also racial and residential divides. 
They described community-oriented policing activities, um, again, those non-enforcement activities, as providing them with opportunities to have positive interactions with communities they serve. And last, that there was this connection between their deployment of procedural justice and their engagement in community-oriented policing that reaffirmed a positive self-image. When I was conducting my research, the department had just wrapped up a four-year initiative aimed at building community trust through increased community engagement and racial reconciliation efforts. An outside research partner evaluated those efforts, sampling residents in jurisdictions with the highest rates of concentrated crime and poverty. The surveys found significant increases in respondents' perceptions of police use of procedural justice, community-focused policing, relatability to police, and willingness to partner with the police. Taken together, these studies suggest that broadening our notions of safety to include considerations of well-being would benefit both officers and the communities they police. When officers are in situations where they can practice procedural justice, namely non-enforcement interactions that don't require a danger imperative, they're in better health. This research builds on work that is calling for a reimagining of public safety and a rethinking of the roles that police can or should have in a healthy society. By focusing on the ways that officer wellness is inextricably linked with the well being of the communities they police, we can see why officers have a vested interest in creating the conditions where policing as we know it is no longer needed. For my dissertation, um, I want to focus on how policing uh, co-constructs violence, as Dr. Jones has argued, both directly through violent interactions and indirectly by stabilizing the conditions that produce violence. So uh, to do that, I want to uh, unpack a couple of core assumptions about policing, that violent crime is some objective fact, and because of this fact, police must be ready to respond with violent means, and uh, that the need to respond to violence um, rather than the institution of policing itself is what is harmful to officers. So very much looking forward to your feedback as I try to flesh those ideas out. Um, thank you. Hi, my name is Bree. Um, I'm going to be, well, thank you for having me. I'm going to be uh, presenting on part of my dissertation today, which really looks at the intersection between technology, surveillance, and policing. So in 2015, San Diego became the first city in the United States to pilot smart streetlights. This new innovation was heralded as a cost-effective and environmentally friendly tool for improving the day-to-day -day operations of urban life. With promises to reduce traffic congestion, increase parking availability, and assist city planners in locating new bike lanes and crosswalks, smart streetlights soon expanded throughout the city. These essential tasks were accomplished through a variety of technologies placed upon streetlights, such as broadband connectivity, sensing technologies, and most importantly, cameras that were constantly recording. While smart streetlights are heralded as an innovative technology, their widespread use raises concerns about privacy, transparency, and accountability. Shortly after adoption, the San Diego Police Department began accessing the footage regularly. In the absence of city policies regarding the use of streetlight camera footage, the San Diego Police Department proceeded to grant itself extensive warrantless access to video footage and the ability to integrate the data into the development of other police technologies, such as gun detection and crime mapping software. Originally, the police department stated that it would only access footage after receiving approval from the mayor's office. However, the department soon decided that this process took too long and instead acquired control of the footage so that it could be accessed directly. The police department did establish some limitations on the accessibility of the footage, stating that it was only to be used in response to serious crimes. However, the department refrained from defining what constitutes a serious crime and having no oversight from the city defined the term broadly. While the footage has been used in cases involving homicide and sexual assault, it has also been used for illegal dumping, vandalism, and graffiti. In a recent report, it was discovered that the footage was most often accessed to surveil Black Lives Matter protests during the summer of 2020. Footage was also most often to be pulled in low-income Black neighborhoods as compared to other parts of the city. Meanwhile, the original promises of streetlight technology have yet to be realized. None of the data collected has been used to decrease tra traffic congestion, increase safety for bikers and pedestrians, 
or provide more public parking spaces. This is mostly because the data collected is uninterpretable and unreliable. Due to these limitations, the city of San Diego shut off all data collection processes, except for the cameras. This has led journalists, activists, and community members to characterize smart streetlight technology as exclusively a tool for police. Despite these failures and controversies in the pilot city of smart streetlight technology, their adoption continues at a rapid pace. At least six other cities have adopted smart streetlights, all of which chose low-income Black neighborhoods as pilot sites and refrained from establishing guidelines for law enforcement. Many city officials cited high crime rates as justification for disproportionately deploying smart streetlights in Black neighborhoods. Smart streetlights are a key feature of smart cities, which have arisen as a global phenomena that promises interconnected technologies to improve urban living and governance. However, smart is largely undefined, as depicted in the graphic from a leading corporation, which includes essential infrastructures found in cities, such as buildings, government, transportation, and even citizens, and simply added the word smart to them. The presumed purposes of these technologies are often shaped by the disparate claims voiced in the promotional materials of competing corporations in the smart city market. But one key component is the collection of vast amounts of data in an attempt to interpret as well as predict the future trends of urban locales. This often includes a wide range of interconnected technologies culminating in the internet of things, which can be described as a vast network of digital infrastructure designed to shape, monitor, and supposedly improve every aspect of urban living. This per pervasive data collection is often achieved not by incorporating entirely new technologies, but by retrofitting and renovating existing technologies to transition cities from quote unquote, dumb to smart. This occurrence is useful in understanding the evolution of streetlights into an essential form of smart technology. However, cities are not disclosing the level of information that can be unearthed, leaving city residents vulnerable to increased surveillance with very little oversight. Further, city officials themselves are rarely considering the ramifications for how these technologies can impact residents. When residents in San Diego were made aware of police use of smart streetlight footage, they sought to hold city council members accountable. In response, city officials actually stated that they had not anticipated law enforcement's use of this technology. But if city officials in San Diego had simply considered the history of policing, this is an occurrence they could have seen coming. Law enforcement's use of smart streetlight footage is not a new occurrence within the carceral state, but part of a long legacy of racialized surveillance targeting blackness that has had dire consequences. In addition, an analysis of race, technology, and policing can provide insight into why San Diego's police department was far more likely to pull footage from smart streetlights in poor black neighborhoods and why Chicago, Baltimore, Cleveland, Detroit, Columbus, and New York all chose poor Black neighborhoods as pilot sites when adopting smart streetlight technology. As SDS scholar Ruha Benjamin suggests, anti-Blackness is often at the center of technological innovations. Black people living in high crime neighborhoods are often the first to encounter cutting edge technological innovations, as evident through the mass adoption of military grade surveillance tools, such as shot spotters and stingray cell site simulators that are retrofitted by law enforcement and then deployed in poor black neighborhoods. As Benjamin states, black people already live in the future. So city officials using their neighborhoods as testing grounds for smart street lights should come as no surprise. In conclusion, as cities rush to adopt ever increasing technologies in the pursuit to become smart, it is important to interrogate what this entails for residents. In response to the police surveillance afforded by law enforcement, Residents of San Diego mobilized to pressure city council members into adopting a comprehensive privacy policy and developing a technology oversight board that will oversee all new technologies the city seeks to adopt. This provides a framework for how residents push back against the encroaching police state afforded by new technologies. When various technologies become embedded and interconnected throughout the urban landscape, questions of how technology shapes and furthers the carceral state become more essential than ever. Thank you. Okay, so I have some comments, but I am moderating. So <laughs> I'm gonna <laughs> hold back, uh, hopefully to the end, but a really great set of, of papers laying the foundation for um, the conversation. We have one uh, question in the queue uh, from our on online audience. And then if someone in the room has a question, we can ship to you next. 
right. So um, from John Simon, hi, John. Uh, great presentations. Can't wait to see the larger projects. Can each of you talk about how resistance to policing and police comes into your project or future research? I bet we'll start with you, Eduardo. Resistance to police? Yeah, can each of you talk about how resistance to policing and police comes into your project or future research? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm not sure if this thing's on, but um, hopefully my voice is coming through. But um, yeah, so the, actually I didn't really get a chance to get into this in my presentation today, but um, part of the history that I'm trying to uncover right now is specifically on that point of how the Chinese community responded to the presence of the Chinatown squad and, and policing and surveillance more broadly in the city. Um, although I am trying to conduct that um, archival research right now, I'm in the process of collecting that data, but um, and often oftentimes um, the community basically relied on, in some cases, the, the geography itself, right? The, the very nature of, of their containment or segregation was in a lot of ways used to kind of push back to how the police were able to enter these spaces or, or to make contact with, with residents in Chinatown. So they kind of turned that against the police in a way or, or the broader community in a way to kind of um, be able to establish a sense of privacy or a semblance of it in the midst of increasing surveillance and attention by, by police officers. So that's definitely one way that I, that I see myself um, kind of interacting with that um, with, in, in that way moving forward with my research. Um, yeah, as I, as I shared, uh, I have an abolitionist kind of framework at the center of my thought process. Uh, the distinction I think that I make um, is between policing the institution and police the individuals. Uh, so in the same way that restorative justice efforts have called us to rethink how we handle perpetrators of harm, I think that's a productive framework for thinking about police officers. And so by caring for them as individuals, I think we will actually um, better create a pathway toward uh, a world where policing as an institution um, isn't needed. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think I kind of only briefly got to touch on this towards the end about the movement in San Diego to kind of push back on a lot of this technology, uh, which I think is a really essential part of this story um, of how residents sort of mobilize um, encroaching on uh, encroaching carceral state and how technology is sort of furthering that. Um, but I also think that a lot of my framework is also historical and that this, the first of all technology, like if you guys talked about before, like technology and police is not a new occurrence and how like in this pursuit of modernization, police have always found a form of technology uh, that can be used and weaponized, um, but also how resistance has always been part of that story as well. Yeah, I think there's a there's a long history to how people have objected to the police uh, hoarding and, and weaponizing information. So, for instance, in the early 20th century, there was a series of bills that died in the New York State Senate uh, that would call for the police to expunge any information collected on a person if they're either released before they're charged or if they're acquitted after trial. Um, they wanted to just purge their fingerprints, any information they had, their mugshots, and um, this failed time after time, but there was an attempt. Um, and in terms of racial state violence, part of the other way that police weaponized information was by putting out only the information they wanted and shaping the narrative after incidents of racial state violence and what happened. Um, and so there's been a long history of building counter archives to this. Um, and so, for instance, after the riot of 1900, which is this big horrific moment and racial state violence in New York, um, black community and civil rights attorneys got together and took over 200 affidavits from people in the community as to what they actually saw happened. And they released it as a pamphlet and they sent it to the president and the governor and the mayor, and they tried to disseminate their version of events. Um, is another uh, way that people have contested how police have used information. And this still happens to this day is the, the perpetuation of a counter archive to police narrative making. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Those were, you know, wonderful presentations. Um, I just wanted to ask a question about uh, 
the incentives uh, that, uh, well, more generally the metrics and the way that the performance of individual officers and of course the performance of police as an organization, you know, how the measurement of that, you know, has changed over time and how it actually interacts with the dynamics that you're all identifying. So if you can speak to that. Who would like to take that up first? I mean, I, I'll um, talk about what they measure and what they don't. <laughs> um, just uh, in the behaviors that it allows for, I think that was one of the most surprising things was that um, story after story uh, about these aggressive interactions were below the threshold of police use of force data. So when we talk about disparities in police use of force, there's this uh, world of interactions that I think most people interested in democracy and well-being um, would want to include in that that aren't being included. So it would block people's pathway to even be able to make claims of, um, you know, I was subjected to excessive force. Like, well, no, you weren't. It's not even a, a use of force per policy, thus per law, you know, because of legal endogeneity. Um, so yeah, so I think that the what we measure matters. Um, I'll leave it at that for now. <laughs> I think one way I would approach that that question um, is trying to kind of have a broader overview or a broader understanding of what it is that policing is hoping to accomplish. Um, and in, in you know the cases that kind of highlighted in my presentation today is often with the impetus is the preservation of private property or, or, or you know, business interests, for example. Um, and in, the na in that name, right, these ideas of social order, law and order, um, often tend to focus this type of attention on racialized populations. Um, even when, right, especially in San Francisco's early history, when the city was predominantly white, these ideas carried over as soon as the Chinese presence started to grow, right? And how do we kind of um, you know, establish this type of policing and then deploy it when, when the community and the demographics start to change. And I think one way that we continue to see these types of stories play out is also, you know, contemporary, uh, the contemporary rise in private policing also in the name of, you know, business interest. And, you know, it, I, I wouldn't be surprised. I don't have this type of data, you know, off the top of my head, but if, you know, financial institutions and tech centers in San Francisco are very much you know, in, in relying on these types of um, private policing mechanisms to also, you know, pres preserve their, th this sense of safety and, and security under their own interest. Does anyone else want to speak to that? I, I guess I'll say that uh, there's always been quite a lot of unquantifiable and informal amount of policing that happens. And throughout the early 20th century, there's an attempt to kind of chip away at how much informal policing happens on the street, meaning like, you know, people are arrested without any real crime in mind just because the police did not like where they were standing or, you know, the, the age old tactic of just like hitting somebody on the head and sending them on their way. Um, and throughout the 20th century through like Taylorism and Fordism and the kind of um, implementation of industrial labor tactics into policing. They tried to make police accountable for every second of their time down to like making their wear wristwatches and, and uh, file index cards so that they can um, write down every interaction they have with the public and all the way up through body cameras. But as we've seen, um, that still does not chip away enough at the fact that so much of policing is done in a really kind of informal and unquantifiable way. Yeah, I'm gonna, did, would you like to add to that, Bernie? Um, no, I just say think for my work when so it comes- let me just pause for one second, because we did have a comment asking the speakers to speak more loudly. So mm -hmm. I don't know if- Okay, that's we can all look at the mic. I think it's easier. Yeah. It is picking up yourself a little closer to your face. Okay, okay. okay. thank you. Okay. Um, I guess for mine, I'm discovering that a big part of the metrics is just how is disorder um, defined, mm -hmm. characterized, um, and that a lot of the work that I'm looking at, since it's looking at cities, it also very much intersects with questions of gentrification. And so what sort of crimes become a concern when you're trying to revitalize, i.e. push out 
uh, black neighborhoods, right? And so things like graffiti, um, illegal dumping kind of arise to this huge level of concern when that might not have been the case before. And so how technology is kind of being used then to, to weaponize such things. Yes, yeah, so I think this is a really you know, interesting question and, and set of responses. So I think I'm going to insert my comments here. Um, and so as we're, you know, we have these conversations on policing, and sometimes we can presume that we know what we all mean by policing, right? And as I was listening to your papers, this question, you know, what is policing? And we have different responses to that, that question. So we have policing as a, as a tool for racial subordination, one that is fundamental to the origin stories, both of the nation uh, and policing, which forces us to ask the question, if that's true, right, and we have evidence to suggest that it, that it is, when did that stop, mm -hmm. right? And you know, we have ideas about, or people have ideas about when that stopped, but I think that, that, that you know, it forces us to ask that empirical question, when was the, the break, right, or the discontinuity from that period if, or in that origin story, if it actually uh, occurred? we get the answer that policing is an institution, right? It's a profession managed in the way and, and having the consequences for professionals that we see in other professions. Uh, policing as a, a public good that is enhanced by technologies and integrated into other technologies quite easily, uh, particularly surveillance. Uh, and then, which begs the question, well, well who, who controls it? Right, and where's power embedded uh, in, in mm -hmm. the expansion of policing? And then certainly policing as violence, right? And policing, is, you know, violence we understand is central to policing. So violence as a, a tool of social control, a tool of racial control, a tool of, a tool of physical control. Uh, and what's striking is the way that, that force, a form of violence is also constructed in policing as a tool of de-escalation, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and so the way that the training and the institution itself can change definitions, if not consequence, right? Uh, and so we have this kind of conversation about what policing is, uh, what it ought to be, and to um, kind of go back to John's question, how resistance informs that, both resistance on the part of the institution, right, to, <laughs> to control what it has controlled, uh, and resistance on the part of the people, which certainly we have seen over the last 18 months and has really fundamentally changed the conversation around policing in a way in which you know, each of you, even though you've doing, been doing this work before that moment, right, is now entering uh, uh, into and, and, and bringing people into the, this conversation. Um, so that's not a set of questions. I guess it is kind of a question, but it's a set of, of comments. And so I'm just curious uh, to hear how you might think about that or to ex extend that. Sorry. Or to, ex oh, yeah. <laughs> to extend that a, a bit. Um, those are really helpful comments, <laughs> actually. Um, and the first thing I thought was, yeah, policing is all of those things, right? Different people, different spaces get different kinds of policing. Um, and I think that at the root of that is inequality. Uh, it was Matt who talked about, you know, all of the different things, labor extraction, uh, gender sex norms, all of that, all of it boils down to, to social hierarchy, right? How do we achieve hierarchy? Through repression, through punishment. How do we do that? We say that uh, the state can control that through uh, policing. So some people get to be at the top and they can get service by police. They can have their private property protected. And then those we've decided are lower on the hierarchy for any reason, get the repressive violence. Right. But at the root for me of all inequality is that violence. Right. This is like Barbara Jean Fields um, talking about race. Like we can't talk about race as identity. We have to talk about racism and the violence that creates that inequality. And so um, until we can tackle that. Right. Then the response is just going to be more violence. So thinking about how we measure what police do, um, and then you're just creating more law enforcement agencies now to police the police, and we're supposed to celebrate when an officer is convicted for wrongdoing, when it's like, well, you made the, the conditions for, you know, it's like, it's until we can tackle with like the fundamental violence of inequality and the logic, I think that perpetuates more and more punishment, then it's, I don't know what my closing thought is, but <laughs> thank you for those comments, I guess. Yeah. Anyone else would want to respond to that? 
or how you see your work fitting into that? Yeah, um, yeah, that's definitely, a, I mean, a great question. And this actually goes back to the conversation you and I were having actually last week, you know, really kind of trying to think about what it means to have this break. Um, and of course, you know, the whole point is that there we haven't seen one yet. Um, and to, to, you know, a lot of the points that Kim was making right now, I think that these understandings of inequality of, or, you know, even going, going back to our origin stories and thinking about um, you know, how we organize ourselves and we in this very broad sense um, around these understandings of race. And you know, one of the things that I was kind of concluding my, my, this, my presentation with today is thinking about what does it mean to also have this significant buy-in from people who also recognize themselves as white? What does it mean for them to have this type of relationship with these institutions historically, presently, and moving forward. And I think something that I'm so curious about moving forward is what, what this will mean to, again, how policing is organized moving forward in this context of demographic change that this country is you know, heading towards becoming, you know, for the first time, a, a racial majority kind of country, right? And, and what does that mean for for whiteness and and policing's role in this in, in these kind of um, ways moving forward. So, for me, it's an ongoing question. I, I don't really have again a clear cut answer to that or concluding thoughts, but I think that's something that has to be at the root of how we understand the project of policing uh, moving forward. Yeah, uh, unless no, oh, that's good. Uh, I think to think about some of those questions would be to to invite an uncomfortable conversation in this nation about citizenship in general mm -hmm. and policing as an indicator of citizenship, both in terms of um, protection by the state as a promise of citizenship um, and who is given that protection and who, who are they protecting those citizens from. Um, and that, you know, I think it's very clear going all the way back to the formation. I mean, there, there's no coincidence that, you know, uh, early police departments in the, in the North, at least, have their roots in uh, in policing in the 1840s and 1850s. And in the South, most of those police forces were, uh, with the exception of New Orleans, were founded in like the 1880s and 1890s. That uh, policing is often a question of citizenship, not just in, in terms of um, who gets denied the rights and protections of citizenship, uh, which are obviously uh, Black people in the long history of the U.S., but also um, police themselves as subjects of a kind of citizen making in the sense that police are often super citizens. They exercise rights and privileges um, that are more exaggerated than even normal people. So I think to, to look at uh, the origins of policing and policing up to this day, we have to have a conversation about, about rights, privileges, and citizenship in general. Bree, did you want to add to that? Um, I really don't think there's another question. Oh, okay. but... I was gonna say, I think that my research is doing, I don't know if I was using the right citizenship, I think because I was thinking of cities, but I was really thinking of the question of like belonging, like who gets mm -hmm. to belong in the smart city, who has a place in the smart city. And since they're about this rhetoric around democracy and transparency and accountability, that's only for certain residents. So certain residents do get better bike lanes because of this technology, they do get better uh, crosswalks, that sort of thing. Uh, but that isn't like, equally shared by all. And it's not really the intention that it would be equally shared by all. And that's a lot of the things that my research is sort of unearthing is that the original question was like, how do technologies that aren't made for the carceral state still find their way like into policing? But now it's just like, how do all technologies actually mm -hmm. further the carceral state? And that policing is always kind of always there in the background of why technologies develop, how it's courted and like marketed, monetized to different cities. Um, so already that that idea that technology can be used to police, to contain, and to also push out certain people through technology is always present. Thank you. Um, I was very struck by Kimberly's research on um, police's, uh, the police institution's sense of well being, individual police officers as well, and the relationship to the community. And since policing can perpetuate trauma among the community, individuals, I was wondering if there's been a study on any uh, police academy that actually looks at the trauma, say that officers might be carrying to try to help humanize them and to work that through and to see if that would have impact on how they interact with the community, if that's even being studied or, or if it would be perhaps seen as even relevant in this overall discussion. Yes, thank you, um, Catherine. So there is, there is a, a 
large body of research on officer trauma. And I think one of the most read books in the police academy is The Emotional Survival of Law Enforcement. It's kind of um, Kevin Gilmartin. Anyway, so that's a big area of emphasis. My problem with that is that it is um, isolated on the officer side. So by studying um, police sort of wellness, and again, maintaining this idea that there is violence and there is crime just out there in the world and police have to confront that. And what can we do to help police officers because there's all these bad people doing bad stuff and they have to see that and they have to interact with that. And so they come up with interventions for more employee assistance programs, more peer support, more therapy, but they don't change the conditions that are um, exposing police to trauma and also forcing police to kind of co-create trauma, right? So it, it's limited. And I think I, I had that on one of my slides that until we can zoom out a little bit and look at the interactional piece of this and recognize that it's not that you can heal police and not deal with the trauma of the communities they're in, that you have to be doing both of those things because both of those things are creating the trauma and a product of this larger state trauma, right? Um, then we're not gonna ever achieve the intended goals. So there, all, there are those studies and I'm sure that, you know, the, it's important to provide people with psychological support, everyone needs that. Um, but again, until you change these chronic situations, I don't think it's ever going to be fully effective. Thank you. And that, that question also gets uh, to a question that was uh, on the online Q&A. Um, I want to ask another question, and, and Bree and Matt, I want to um, ask you to respond to this first. So if we think about this origin story uh, and Eduardo's work uh, and moving through the contemporary uh, moment and, and you know, even this, the, the, the conversation uh, or the response to the question about, or the question and the response to the question about trauma and violence, we're very often talking about physical violence, right, and force. Uh, but your work forces us to think about control and violence in other ways, right? Uh, and so, and that is in some ways why these kinds of technologies can be so easily right, um, adopted by people in cities because they think it's a degree removed, right? From physical violence. And so it's getting the violence out of policing. Uh, and so I know you've been on the front line of, of battles around this and, and technology and surveillance. And I'm curious how you think about the the, the potential of these technologies to do that uh, and how it is that this promise, whether stated or, or, or implicit, um, is in fact, uh, or perhaps not, the basis for reforms that perhaps aren't quite reforms, if I'm mm -hmm. listening to, to your work, yeah. Uh, you sure, yeah, um, so I didn't really get into it in this presentation, but a huge part of my dissertation is historical, um, and specifically looking at the adoption of streetlights um, mm -hmm. back in like the 18th, 17th to the 19th century, really, um, which if anyone wants to not talk about, I really love talking about how <laughs> streetlights were adopted, um, because a lot of it was um, actually originally brought in throughout Europe by militaries when they would take over and conquer a new city, they would bring in streetlights so they would make sure to be able to quash any rebellion that forms at nighttime. Mm -hmm. um, and then they sort of became part of this modernity within cities of when cities wanted to have things like theaters and when they wanted to have sort of like restaurants at night, this sort of option for the bourgeoisie class to come in at nighttime. Um, they essentially use streetlights to push out essentially sex workers, uh, people who are drunk, people who are homeless, um, so that they could have like these clean, nicer, tidier streets at night for, for like, uh, the upper class. Um, and so that becomes like a huge part of the story as well that like putting cameras on streetlights isn't just like this new innovative, like, wow, we're gonna take this depoliticalized like technology. It's like already the technology was political and already mm -hmm. it was in service to the state and power um, and all these questions around class, race and belonging. Um, but then, so then putting a, a camera on it really just kind of makes sense at that point, if you look at it within that trajectory, like it's just mm -hmm. the next evolution um, of making this technology um, within the modernity of the city. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that the resistance element is kind of hard um, that there are, the resistance that's coming through like these community oversight boards. Um, but it's hard to like really quantify like what that might look like long term, um, especially since it's not, this isn't just a story about police, it's also about city council members, it's also about corporations, like corporations have a huge part in this, right? So it's not like there's one sort of 
uh, body of, of the state that you can kind of intervene in. And when you have corporations who have completely different guidelines that they're not even following, but they don't even, they don't have an accountability to residents in the same way, that question becomes even murkier. Um, so I don't, I don't have an answer. <laughs> and I don't think that like anyone really does right. in, this, in this moment. I think that mm -hmm. will be a continued battle as this technology uh, goes through, like throughout different cities throughout the country of like who, who is accountable to who, like who, what sort of accountability is there? Um, and is there any way to actually enforce that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, I think um, it's it's not violence, like you say, like handcuffs or a baton, but it is, it is a way of weaponizing vulnerability in the sense that you are more vulnerable to the state when they know exactly where you are at any given time. They know who your acquaintances are, who your family is, where you work. Um, and, you know, there, there are a, a lot of times like, right, I mean, at the streetlights are a great example um, all the way through, you know, when I, a lot of my work is about how early 20th century police departments learned a lot of tactics from the US occupation of Cuba and the Philippines. And one of the interesting things I see parallel almost simultaneously um, in the Philippines and in, you know, immigrant neighborhoods of New York is um, the imposition of, of street names and, and addresses, um, which seems like a kind of like modern state thing to do. Um, but it was very much a mechanism of social control because if you, you know, you knew where an insurrectionist was in Cuba, you couldn't say like, turn a left at the tree and then go half a mile. You know, it had to be like, they live at 123 Main Street. Um, and, and this was done simultaneously in New York where you would, they would literally tear down like winding alleyways and uh, these different intersections where there are a lot of unofficial housing had cropped up um, and, and, you know, apartments that were not on blueprints. There was an area called the Mulberry Bend in New York where it was said that um, rent collectors had not extracted rent from there in like six or seven years because only the people who lived there knew how to navigate it properly. Um, and so it, to me, surveillance is, is a, it's like, a, it is a way of weaponizing vulnerability. It is a way of, of making people vulnerable to the violent extraction. Do you have any other questions from the audience? So we have one question online, um, and I don't um, know if, if you will have a response to this, but certainly um, it brings us into the um, campus uh, and its its environment. So I haven't attended UCB for quite a while. What is your sense of the humanity of police treatment of the unhoused at People's Park and the larger Berkeley community these days? And so, and I'll just, you know, build on that to, to ask um, each of you to ground our work, your work into what you see happening and unfolding both, you know, at, on campus in its environs and in the Bay Area more broadly. Yeah, I guess I'll yeah, start. <laughs> Thank you. And I, I mean, I, I think part of the reason why I was interested in this project is you know, I live in West Oakland mm -hmm. where, you know, technology and question technology in the cities are very prominent being in the Bay Area and also living in an area, seeing it kind of go through this redevelopment um, within the area surrounding myself, like where, where, you know, I'm living and seeing technology really being used, like we're getting public Wi-Fi and that's huge, right, in Oakland because there's a lot of spots where there's just no Wi-Fi. Um, the Wi-Fi is there, it's just not adequate at all. But the flip side of that is that Wi-Fi also can be used to track you, your specific location, where you move throughout the city. Like there's always a cost at that. Mm -hmm. And so looking at an area that's been historically underserved and the sort of like negotiations um, that we have to kind of make to get this basic service of, of Wi-Fi, right? And then also knowing that they're, as another side of that and that people are being pushed out like very vividly um, mm -hmm. and sort of how technology is also being used in that sense. So part of the draw of Oakland is, well, now we have this Wi-Fi, we can, we can have better businesses, we can attract new people to the area, but it's very clear you know, who that's supposed to be. Um, so I think that for me, it's something that I think about kind of just daily walking around mm -hmm. the Bay because the questions are really pressing here. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, so I'll, I'll try to take a, make some comments on that, but um, I Eduardo, think- can you bring the mic a little bit? Yeah, closer? so this actually makes me think of a point that Matt raised earlier when we were, we were talking about, or he was talking about, um, you know, elements of policing that are unmeasurable, right? Um, and, you know, to Bree's point right now, and oftentimes um, what we see in policing, particularly around campus and specifically as it relates to uh, People's Park is, 
you know, like a continued effort to, to drive out or push out, um, you know, this, these quote unquote problem populations or social problems kind of away from, from the view at least of, of you know, Ber the Berkeley campus um, in itself. And, um, you know, how, even though it might not be measurable, but, you know, how might this result in, you know, let's say the psychic violence that comes with this understanding that you are continuously being driven out, that you're continuously being told that you're unwanted. Um, and, and how do you measure something like that? Um, and even, you know, if it doesn't make it into like official uh, record, um, you know, what, what type of, again, you know, these understandings of violence and kind of thinking about these issues more broadly as even if police do not put their hands on you or do not kind of violently drive you out, um, it still has violent outcomes um, that are expressed in different ways. And, and I, you know, that's, immediately made me think of, of, of this type of issue, so. And then Matt, do you want to add uh, Sure, um, so, I mean, I think uh, that Bree's point holds very strongly, which is in that we have um, a sense that any piece of the state that can be used for the public good often becomes um, co-opted into becoming part of the the punitive governance um, process, and you know, in in San Francisco, I think um, two things we see is is simultaneously things that were meant for the public good are being co-opted into uh, punitive governance, and things that were meant only for extreme circumstances, a lot of like counterterrorism resources or national emergency uh, nat or natural emergency resources being co-opted both into low level and political policing. And so, for instance, I'm involved in a in a case through uh, EFF where I work, where uh, a lot of neighborhoods have individually funded by a very wealthy person um, uh, business improvement district cameras, which are supposed to be for um, like public uh, dumping of garbage. It's supposed to be for like public cleanliness and like uh, uh, beautification processes in commercial districts. Um, but what we found was during the Black Lives Matter protest last, early last, uh, late last May and early last June, uh, the San Francisco Police Department got full access 24 hours streaming to the Business Improvement District cameras, over 400 cameras in uh, Union Square area of San Francisco to watch the protests. And this violated the, the surveillance ordinance that we have in San Francisco and so has prompted a, a civil rights lawsuit. Um, but yeah, so I think in the Bay Area, we see simultaneously uh, aspects of governance that are meant for the public good and aspects meant for only extreme circumstances, both being co-opted into like everyday low level punitive and political policing. Thank you. Do we have time for one more question about where, or how are we with time? Five minutes, okay. So I think unless there's a question in the room, I think uh, I'm gonna take the, the privilege here to ask a final um, question. Um, and you know, and, and folks can choose to to answer it. If it's just too heavy, you can pass. Uh, we're still in a heavy time. But if we think about you know the work, I know I've worked closely with Eduardo and Bree and followed the, their progress through through um, you know your career here. Uh, and so you were doing this work like like each of you on the panel before the pandemic, before the uprisings of summer 2020, uh, and you've done this work to some degree through that time. Uh, and we're here today. Um, and so I'm curious about, you know, given um, that journey, uh, and, and, and I, asked, I don't ask this, this question that students especially often get asked, why does it matter? Why does your work matter, right? I don't ask that question because I think it reflects like some degree of a privilege hierarchy <laughs> of knowledge that matters to some in obvious ways, right, and, and not to others. But I do ask this, my, my, my students and, and, and folks and myself, the question, what's at stake? Like, what's at stake in your project? And how um, has that changed, if it has changed at all? Or how has it become more clear to you, perhaps over uh, this time? That was a heavy question. It is, it's real. <laughs> this is heavy work. You know, we live in the academy, but we know that this is not something that lives in the academy. And the questions and the work that we do is in part because of what's happening in our lives, lives of people that we care about, um, you know, and people out, people out there in the world. Um, so I apologize for the heaviness <laughs> of it, but you know, and it is a burden that we carry. I think. Right. Mm -hmm. I'll I'll try to be brief on this. I I feel like I have a lot to say. There's a lot of 
emotions being generated right now. Um, and this actually speaks to, again, something that I brought up when we talked last week, where, you know, especially during the height of the pandemic and, you know, watching all these police riot or rioting in the streets unfold uh, in protests against police violence, I did think to myself or ask myself, so why will people care if I present on 1850 San Francisco and what the archive has to say or maybe does not have to say, right? And I, I struggle with that quite a bit. Um, but I think what's so important about this question and about this work is people's lives are getting cut short, right? Um, systematically so. Um, and people's experiences with policing broadly speaking, but I think um, you know, expanding this even bigger to questions around citizenship, for example, which um, I grew up undocumented in the US. So this is something that like was always like, even from a very young age without really understanding the weight of that type of curiosity was always in the back of my mind. Like, what does this mean for my own well-being, for my family's well-being, and for our ability to even stay connected, right? Um, so this now implicates family separation, whether that's through arrest, through detention, through incarceration, and everything else that comes out of um, these projects uh, of, of policing. And I think for me, that's really what's at stake, right? Um, yeah, just, I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you, Edward. I appreciate that. Yeah. yeah. And folks can definitely pass if it's too heavy. It is, yeah. Um, no, I'll, I'll keep it brief. Um, but I think first the pandemic um, was key to um, how I was really questioning uh, this theater of safety. Who is safe? What is safe? When? How? At, at um, whose expense, right, with the essential um, workers being people serving margaritas. So mm -hmm. that was part of it. Um, and also I saw um, officers doing things in the name of their own health that uh, black and brown communities had been asking for, um, such as not doing mm -hmm. search warrants, um, not doing the proactive policing. So like when when we could rethink safety more broadly to include health, I saw more alignment of the things that we wanted. And um, and also just how much hurt and anger I felt during the George Floyd, it, um, my own personal process to work through that uh, re sort of committed me to this path of like the praxis of love and really trying to see humanity mm -hmm. and understanding that when I am most angry that underneath that there is hurt um, and I'm more likely to hurt others um, when I'm feeling that and, mm -hmm. and to try to be able to access love in those moments, I think is at the core of how I'm thinking about my work too. Mm -hmm. so. Thank you for that. Yeah. Oh yeah, I kind of struggle with this question. I think because I often get a lot of external pressure, people I won't name uh, to like <laughs> kind of like universalize my projects in a lot of ways to be like, mm -hmm. well, cameras on streetlights affect all of us mm -hmm. you know we'll all have to deal with these issues of incursions on our privacy mm -hmm. um so why don't you make this project something that will speak to everyone mm -hmm. um and mm -hmm. that to me it it's tr true on the one hand like this you know surveillance technology does impact everyone but that's not an equitable burden um mm -hmm. and so I have to kind of make this argument that really, you know, in all the neighbors, all the cities I'm looking at, they're like using black neighborhoods to test mm -hmm. this. And it has like these very serious consequences, not just in the form of policing and that they've been used in, you know, different uh, court cases for arrest, that sort of thing. But it's also like, you know, at the very basic level, like maybe you just want to walk around your neighborhood, you mm -hmm. know, with your friends and not have cameras just pointed at you that can be used at any moment that you might not even know about. Right. And that's just like, it doesn't seem maybe like a big deal in the grand scheme of all that's at stake, but it is something that like maybe just people should be able to belong in a space that they're in and not feel this constant pressure mm -hmm. to be surveilled and have that weaponized um, against them and make them feel that they, um, that they don't, they don't belong or that they don't have a place in the, the new smart city. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I guess I think there's a, a foundational myth about policing in the United States that um, that there there you know there was a point where either either there was a point in which it was um, better and it got worse or there was a point where it was bad and it got better and I think um, both are wrong and and retelling the origin stories of American policing 
uh, centering race and racial subordination um, is is really important because it shows that police to this day are are still um, the police department as an institution is still doing the task that it was founded to do, um, and that no matter how much you change it, it, it is still serving that function. And uh, and that way, it calls us to ask if there are other institutions or other ways we could be a reorganizing society to de-emphasize the police department as our primary means of public safety and public health. Thank you. So join me, folks, in thanking each of our panelists for, for what's coming next and the, the work in progress and, and the work that's going to be coming out of yes. this. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank